Clairvoyance stage at uh, MCH 2022. I'm very happy to, well, actually I'm slightly depressed to, to it's the topic, to introduce Igor to talk about uh, what may, what will happen with, with climate change. So, Igor, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for coming. This is, of course, the... Um, I am the thing standing between you and beer and chunk, and I very much appreciate your presence. So I know it's a graveyard shift. Um, for your convenience, and you can leave after this, it's fine. TLDR, as every good presentation should have. Um, this is a part of a series that has been developing as my own thinking about this topic develops. This was the first one. Uh, oops, quite literally. And then, as time went on, and this is the uh, a few years later in the next Balkan, we are actually having a system being rooted by forces we do not want. Um, that's not good. And then, of course, it gets worse. And I am very sorry to have probably the most depressing talk of MCH, but the idea is better to be prepared and aware than to act as if it's not there. So uh, let's not reboot the system, even though the data center might want to do that. So uh, welcome to may slash will contain climate change. My name is Igor Nikolic. I'm an associate professor at University of Delft, but that's not the important part. The important part, I'm a nerd, just like all of us here. Um, I'm a neurodiverse dad, uh, wannabe artist, hobby blacksmith. I have two little angels. No, they're smelly teenagers, but they do drive around trash, which is good. Um, I make stuff. I like to talk about, about th these things. And um, yeah, so that's me. Um, I've been studying sustainable development for my entire adult life. And I'm not happy for it, but it's important. And I want to share the things that I know, and especially what do we do about these things, right? Um, ask questions. There is a, TLD, there is a man, man page. Do ask questions. Please keep it to clarifications because of the limited time. There is a village called Emergent Earth. Claudia, can you wave? Together with Claudia, yay, we are organizing uh, a village which is a separate track to talk about these topics. Come to see us. It is on the far right of the program, not of anything else. So scroll the program. You'll see it. On, I'll show you in a second. Yeah. OK. So. Um, it's okay to leave if it's too much. I will not be upset. Well, well I'm just a little bit. What are we going to do? Uh, three things, three main things. First, I want to talk about science. I will throw facts and citations at you just to show where are we, what's going on to the best of my knowledge. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm a modeler. I build, uh, study sustainable systems, the transitions of industrial and things like that. But I do know my science. So this is what we know for fact. That will be part one. Part two will be informed guesswork. Right? A hypothesis, things that I expect based on everything I know. Part three will be designed. What do we do about this stuff as a bunch of nerds? And we can do more than you think. And then there is a bit of hope. Because it's so sad to leave you with a sad story. So we'll try our best. So context and a bit of theory, science starting. Um, I want to introduce you to a couple of concepts before we dive in so it makes conversation easy. The first concept I would like to share with you is the notion of a wicked problem. Right? A wicked problem is a technical term. The citation is on the bottom. You can find it, a really nice paper. Uh, if you cannot download it, there is this uh, website called <coughs> Sci-Hub. Um, I'm sure they have it. So what are wicked problems? Wicked problems are problems that do not have a definite problem formulation. It's kind of like, let's organize a hacker event. What does that mean? Right? There is no clear problem. It's impossible to measure or claim success. We solved climate change. We solved hacker camps? I don't know. There, sir. Solutions can only be good or bad, not true or false. There is no right or wrong in a wicked problem. There is, it kind of works, but it's meh. 
right? There's usually no perfect solution. You cannot optimize your way out of a wicked problem. Uh, there's always more than one reason why things are the way they are, and there's always multiple solutions to these things. And whenever you see a problem, you see a symptom, it usually is a symptom of something else. And it's, it's kind of meatballs and spaghetti, right? It's all kind of connected. And um, Objective scientific solutions are impossible. And I do not use the word lightly, impossible, right? Uh, it is all about values and norms, because what is a good world to live in? Well, I might think there's a certain way that's, that's good, but maybe you disagree. So, but it's still the same world. So how do we, right? Um, solutions are one shot. You got one try, and then that's it. You fucked up forever, right? And you cannot afford to be wrong, right? You cannot make a mistake. You must act. You know that you don't know. Good luck, right? If this was a cartoon series, it would be really funny, except it's the sustainability problem, the climate change problem, the whole transition problem of human species. Where do we go into the future? How is it even going to look like? Who, who's right? The uh, Elon Musk's and we should all go to Mars and be his slaves? Or the Chinese government? Or what? I mean, I don't know. Then, so that's one bit of theory. The other bit of theory I want to talk to you about is chaos. Right? And chaos is ridiculously misunderstood, which is always fun. Um, chaos means chaos occurs. Chaotic systems are systems that are iterative, things that go, repeat what they do. Economy is chaotic because you trade, and then you trade again, and you go buy bread again, and you buy bread again. And it's these repeated actions that characterize the systems. They have, they're path dependent, so history matters. Where you come from determines where you can go. Okay? And they're very sensitive to initial conditions, the famous butterfly. Right? So the red blob there is the Lorentz butterfly. This is a set of differential equations. I can give you three lectures on this, which I won't. Uh, but this is a set of differential equations that has unique properties. Namely, the um, small, oh, my image is overlapping. That's not good. Tiny impacts, small changes in variables can have very large effects on the system's behavior. But inverse is also true. Massive changes to the inputs can produce no effect. So you can have butterflies flapping their wings, causing tornadoes, which is, because this is a weather system. That's how it started, right? That's a model of weather. But you could also have a 747 try to land in the middle of a field, and not a single little uh, tent moves. That's what chaotic systems are. They have these characteristic structures. They're stuck in what's technically called an attractor. And Attractors are a pain in the ass, right? NASA uses attractors in these chaotic orbits. You shoot in a rocket, you have this unstable orbit, and at some point you give it a push and it flips over the orbit around the moon. Let me demonstrate. Uh, I will show you an outcome of a simulation. This is no climate. This is a so-called predator-prey system, the Lotka Volterra, an agent-based model over there. Wolf, sheep, grass, energy comes in, grass grows. Um, sheep run around, eat grass, make more sheep. Wolves run around, eat sheep, make more wolves. That's it. That dynamics is what I'm going to show you. What am I doing here? I am changing in the simulation the speed at which the grass grows back. So I'm adding energy into the system. I'm feeding the system by increasing the grass grows faster and faster. This is a state diagram showing you the relationships of the number of sheep, number of wolves, and the amount of grass. Make sense? Now, what do you observe? You observe a dynamic system. It's oscillating. It's so it's wolves go up, uh, sheep, sheep go down, grass goes up, wolves go up and down. But as I'm adding energy, something weird is happening. It's oscillating more and more heavily, but it's still in the same corner until Oh fuck, sheep world. Wolves have died out. There's no more grass, there's only sheep, and as soon as grass grows up, sheep eat it and they grow more sheep and that's it. Did you see how it happened? Oscillate, oscillate, it's still the same thing, still the same thing, oh fuck. You see the path, you see the history, it cannot just go there, and it has to follow a path to get there. Right? And this is what you need to understand when you think about climate change or any sustainability discussion. It's path dependent, it's chaotic, it's slow, insensitive to change until it hits you in the face and then you're screwed.
Make sense? Okay, basic chaos theory. And now watch this. Paper uh, in Nature, Climate Change. This is the jet stream, right? You know about the jet stream? It's a wind that's spinning around the poles. And it's a chaotic system. It's a wind, so it's coming from somewhere, it's going somewhere, and it is being fed by more heat. Planet is warming up, CO2, you know all of that, right? There's more energy in the system, and what is it doing? It is flip-flopping more and more and more and more. It's always messy, right? Chaotic systems are always messy, they're never quite stable, but they're roughly the pattern remains. Now watch those big loops appearing. It's like, holy fuck, what's going on? Why is it suddenly 30 Celsius in the fucking North Pole? That's not supposed to happen. Well, it's because hot air happened to just, because it has more energy, it's flip-flopping, it's flying off into places it shouldn't be flying off to. Does that make sense? Right, so this is literally copy-paste chaotic systems. Probably the most depressing plot ever. Deviation of average temperature over time. Zero, minus one, plus one, about long-term averages, right? And I'm sure you've seen this, it was all over Twitter. And this is what, 1930s? So nothing is happening. Realize we, have, we had our first world war, we are having second world war, we are having massive industrialization, we are building factories, we are making trains, power plants, building all these things, and it's all fine-ish. 70s, 70s people around, yay, yay, there we go. And that's of course when it started going downhill. It's overall fault, I'm sorry, Vesna. But, whoa, wait. There is, again, remember, chaotic systems, they are roughly somewhere, never exactly there, but roughly around that area, but suddenly something is pushing us somewhere, and somewhere probably not very good. Now, if you turn this around, you see that we are getting there. And also watch 40 or 100 years of delay. We've been pumping CO2 and mining coal since the Industrial Revolution. Not as fast as now, but increasingly. And it takes a while. There's that delay effect of complex systems, of chaotic systems. It takes a while while they do their thing. But once they do, oh, fuck. You don't stop a tanker, right? And if you know big ships, tankers, if they want to break, they need 25 to 30 kilometers to stop. So you could like hit the brakes, but no. So, okay, we're, this is no fun. To make you even more depressed, this is the recent IPCC report that just came out. Okay, so we are not in a good place, people. This is not good. We are, there is your simulated natural, if you only had solar volcanic, you know, when the climate change engineers go, no, but it's the sun. No, it's not the sun. Yes, it has an effect, of course, it's oscillating, but you don't get that. And we do get that. I mean, uh, this XKCD, who doesn't love it, right? You, I'm sure you've seen this one. That's the historic timeline for past 200 million years or something-ish. The line never comes into red until, meh, 2016. This is not natural. We are a step function, right? I'm sure there's lots of signals people here. You know what happens when you just throw up the voltage from zero to five, bomb. Nothing like that. That's like, holy cow. Weather doesn't like that. We are in a very interesting situation. This is not just history. Oh, but it has been hot in the past. Of course it has. Several 100 million years ago, yes, we did have, you know, 50 million years ago, we had 700 to 900 ppm CO2. That's how the world looked like. Okay, we are now hitting, what is it, 470-ish, slowly, 450, 460. Basically, Amsterdam, <laughs> <laughs> Beachside property, right? I hope you own a boat. Uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, nope. Right? There is a, a, our economist, God bless you. Any economists in the rooms? Uh, um, no, anybody be upset? No. So the, the person who got the Nobel Prize for economics, <clears throat> and I will try not to swear, has calculated that the optimal global warming for the economy is 14.7 degrees Celsius, not the 0.7. Last time this planet had 14 Celsius average higher temperature, there were palm trees of fucking Greenland. You tell me that's optimal, good luck, we're in trouble. But they got a noble, so must be right. 
I was not going to swear. Anyway, economists, thank you. Spe neoclassical economists. There's lo lots of sane economists, don't get me wrong. So we are in an interesting situation. So this is where I want to stop the science, because we can rant about this for a long time, but hope you all know this. What, are, what does this mean? Because sure, you can look at numbers, you can look at the scary maps, but now what? Well, changes in impacts. The first thing is, even if we stop now, remember the chaotic attractor, remember the tanker, even if we stop now, it will take geological timescales to have that carbon removed. I want you to just think about what a geological timescale means. Humanity in its current form has existed between 200,000 to 2 million years at best. Geologists count in mega years as the smallest unit, right? So the time where you can expect the CO2 to drop naturally will be longer than humanity has ever existed. AKA, do not think as this summer as the hottest of your life, think about it as the coldest summer of your future. Now this keeps me awake, awake at night, I have to, this, no, that's what we know. Impacts, there's things we know are gonna happen, I mix those in, I'm gonna talk a little bit, just mention a few things that I know that we don't know, and there's lots of things we have no idea about. Right, the famous Romsfield uh, unknown unknowns. These changes will be sudden, and of course I forgot to start, start my timer. Yeah. They will be sudden, but they will also be gradual. Both things will happen. Systems react at different times. Some, some systems react really quickly, some will take a while to develop. There will be ad hoc sudden things that don't repeat, and there will be systemic changes. Let's unpack this, just to various categories to give us some flavor. Ecological much more frequent, much more extreme weather. Think about the shittiest kind of weather you have where you live, and it's different for all of us. For me in Holland, it will be storms, more storms, shittier storms, it will be heat waves, more rain, just more. Again, remember the oscillating wolves and sheep, it's just gonna be that, but quicker, and more extreme, yeah? Snow, droughts, you know, anything. Ecosystems will be out of whack. Many species cannot adapt. I do want to point out, nature, the planet, life on Earth is fine. Life on Earth doesn't give a fuck about humans. Humans are not gonna be fine. There will be life, we will not kill life. I, I cannot imagine a scenario where humanity kills life on this planet. Lots of scenarios where humanity kills itself. Right, so life will be, I mean, geological timescales, right? In a few million years, whatever bacteria will involve consciousness and cockroaches get, get to rule the world, it's gonna be fine, life-wise not humanity-wise. Pollination, 80% decrease. There was a big study in Germany recently that counted bugs. 70 to 80% of the bugs are gone. Thank you, Bayer and Monsanto and Neonic Antonides and temperature changes. Oops, bees go, we go, you know. Yeah. Arable land loss, carbon capture going down. We cannot capture so much CO2 anymore. Um, methane, right? You know that stuff? Permafrost, melting. Moment that permafrost melts, all that biomass starts to rot. Methane comes up, methane is 20 or 20, 20 times worse than CO2 in terms of global warming potential. Runaways, nonlinearity is flip flopping into the next state. Joy. There's a pH, there's a, uh, if the pH, uh, pH of the oceans hits a critical temperature, all bacteria, all. Um, um, Plankton will start dissolving. Just literally, chemically, will dissolve. 80% of our oxygen comes from them. If you're not there, I mean, it's going to take a while, but eh, economic. Increase in equality, I don't need to tell you about that. You know what kind of world we live in. Political instability, we've seen it, right? Uh, we've seen um, the Arab Spring, the price of grain triggers social unrest, triggers other things, triggers speculation. Food prices, energy prices, you know, I'm sure you've seen your electricity bill recently. Decrease in earning potential, you might not be able to make so much money. Um, Europe, service oriented. Who's gonna need services if you need to eat? Uh, unavailability of products and raw materials, right? They ever given. There was a lot of very nasty jokes and memes I could have put up, but I didn't. But yeah, you remember that one, how much that affected everything. Now imagine if it seriously starts, seriously starts getting disrupted. Logistic chains, all of that, that's going to be interesting. And of course, for each and one of us, the effects will be different at individual level, but systematically, these are the things we're looking at. Financial, 
oh, it's okay. against the 1%. Realize we are the 1%. You would not be here if you're not. Now, it doesn't feel like it, especially if you're a young student or you have no income. You're like, what the fuck, I'm not rich. Globally, you are well off, right? There is the income distribution. We are talking about a, when you talk about 1%, you're thinking about the top 100 people, the top 1,000 people and that own. You know. So there is that. Um, financial markets are volatile because they're moving quickly across the planet. They're trying to seek interest, looking for stability, moving around, causing instability because of that, right? Property boom bust cycles, we know all of that. So suddenly you bought all this fancy property for lots of money and now it's flooded. Oh fuck, who's gonna buy it? Nobody. If you own property in Florida, sell now. Right? You cannot build dikes around Florida because of the porous limestone, so you can build a dike, water comes under, and you're done. So it's, my gaming buddies are from Florida, and it's always really fun when talk to them about this. Um, yeah, oh, but of course, energy transition and sustainability is way too expensive. We can't afford that because we just spent trillions of dollars on wars. But hey, you know, priorities. Social. Um, my God. If you think uh, the hate for foreigners and immigrants is bad, Imagine 150 million Bangladeshis having no home. Just one of the many countries at the extreme risk of uh, flooding. Right? 41% of the 163 million live under 10 meters. Poor country, limited ability to organize and get built. It's a delta, so it's got water both sides. And then suddenly, you know, Netherlands is in panic because a few hundred thousand people from Syria want to come in. Imagine a few hundred million standing on the borders. This is going to happen. How are we going to deal with it? Well, I have, a, I have a, a hint. Aging population, when you're old, you're naturally more conservative because old people are just conservative because they have more history to protect and future to build, right? We have almost no, less and less babies, so who cares? I'm obviously exaggerating, but you get it, right? Fear, uncertainty, Alzheimer, because that's old people get that, I mean, you know. So you're gonna end up voting more conservatives. Yay, less of the more religious, all of the, when people are afraid, basic psychological mechanisms are grab the things you know, right? Security, what do you know? Your race, your, your religion, your nation, me, us, not them, right? Humans don't work at scale of six billion people. Humans work at scale of 150 to 200 people, a village. We have villages here, right? Because that's us, not them. Not because we're bad, but that's just human minds. And of course, we have 20, 30 years of neoliberal bullshit because markets are amazing and markets are going to fix everything and just let's make corporations people and all of that. Uh, okay. Good. So, technological. Uh, what can you expect? Uh, look at refugee camps for your future. Go to Crete, be in a refugee camp. You want to eat? You give up your biometrics. You don't want that? Fine, you go hungry. Right? Retinal scans, get food. Imagine that being standard operating procedure in a supermarket. But my privacy, oh, I don't care, you want to eat? Again, it's a long, but in a world where there's limited supply, governments honestly trying to be you know, good and try to give everybody something they'll have to control, you're going to have to end up something extreme. Reduced access to limitations and criminalizations of information of technology, because again, if you're an honest government, you're trying to control. You're not being even evil, but you end up doing very evil things because of that. Um, in pockets, you're gonna have high tech, right? I mean, I really don't like how much Fallout, and I'm sure there's people who played Fallout the game or Cyberpunk, they're like, yeah, that, yeah that's actually not too crazy. It makes sense. It's, it's a logical conclusion of what is going on. Because again, changes, because we are path dependent systems, we have these histories, we cannot just change. You cannot just, oh, let's do everything decentralized energy. Yes, and then several million kilometers of existing power lines, they're gonna just disappear? Of course not. Energy, increasing prices of energy, storage capacity, fuels, all of that. Lithium is running scarce. Oil, we know about that. Stability of supply is always a problem. Stability of distribution, I, I mean, it was sad, but funny. Uh, that image is from a few days back. People were hosing down bridges in Amsterdam because they were buckling from the heat. They were not designed for this. No bridge anywhere in Northwestern Europe, or most of Europe, is designed to, exp to have this kind of heat. There is only so much hoses, 
right? And this is just one example. So imagine things cascadingly going fucked up because it's over everywhere all the time. You can't deal. I work a lot with power companies with, with my research and my studies and my models. This is a quote. I don't want to put a name there about a major company building major infrastructure. Sure, I can give you 380 kilowatt lines. Give me 10 years, seven years of permits, and maybe I can buy enough copper and maybe I have enough people to build it then. Rapid transition? No, because it's expensive, slow, it's big, it's ill-organized and hard. One does not just waltz into energy transition. One slowly builds it over time. Time you don't have. Transport, you might not be able to travel. I'm born in a country that has had war. I know how hard it is to leave a country, right? Try entering a country where they don't want you there. Yes, but uh, my country's flooded, yeah, and? N not my problem, buddy, fuck off. Yes, but, yes, but I am important. No, you're not. Again, not a friendly thing, but try being black, Muslim, female, leaving Syria because they bombed your house and sitting in Greek camp. That's reality you might have to live with at some point, you or your kids. I do have kids before you ask, so yes, I'm worried. Uh, weather disruptions to air, you know, all of this is going to be very interesting. Medicine, same thing. Amazing things are coming. There is um, expectations that um, first humans are born who will live to be routinely 120 or 130 years old. Imagine that population of ever-growing people. Never, uh, it's going to be a mess. Lots of biodiversity. We get lots of drugs from nature. We're killing that. Uh, Supply chains, right? I had a panic about a year back when suddenly my pills were not available. If I stop, I'm in trouble, so shit, how do I do this? Because, well, it's too bad, let's go, go crazy, right? Um, antibiotic resistance, all of those things are fun. Um, but okay, so these are the things that we need to understand because if we are going to do something about it or be prepared, one needs to know the attack surfaces. What is the stuff that's gonna affect us so we can start preparing? Right? And I think many of you do InfoSec, you do the same thing. What is my APTs? What am I building against? So, some strategies. Um, everything I want to say here makes sense within what I understand is context to me. This might not work for you. Because a different person, different history, who you are, where you are, when you are. So take it with a grain of salt, but think about those big drivers I mentioned, and think about how that means to you. So, there's a bunch of useless stuff that's out there that's very popular. Standard prepping. I'm going to have gazillion bullets and I'm going to have lots of cans. Right, and then? Just no. Just no. Um, hoarding inner wood strategies, especially if you're European, <laughs> which woods? Where? You and 17 gazillion other people around you. Of course not. Maybe it works if you're, but not here. So paranoia, panic, no. Useless. You just have to be prepared, not panicked. But of course, disaster preparedness makes perfect sense, right? If you live in a place you know you, you're likely to hit, be hit by a flood or you're going to have storms, you better be prepared. That would be stupid not to, which depends on where you are, what it is. So I'll just leave. No, you will not. You will not leave. You will not be able to leave even if you want to. You will not be welcome anywhere. The world that is disrupted at this level will not be able to be gentle and friendly, right? Especially if you're not, you know, slightly, be, slightly different than your average middle-aged white male. Because that's unfortunately the fucked up world we live in, so, you know, think about it. What is useful? Well, this, and I do not say that lightly, I do believe these are the kinds of events that give me hope in humanity, because we can pull this off with a bunch of dedicated, focused people. So find them. They're th open things. Learn how things, if you don't hack it, you don't own it. We know that. Right? You know how the, uh, I don't know if you caught that, um, um, Russians were stealing Ukrainian farming equipment for whatever, and then, oh, look at us being so cool, then John Deere has disabled, now, now stolen Russian equipment. Look, win for John Deere. Wait, so they just turned them off for the Russians in this case, but when are they going to turn them off for me? When they feel like it, how does that then? Well, wait. Critical. What is really going on? We, we live in the world of disinformation. We know that. Verify 
trust but verify, but it's really, really it takes time. Follow money. You know, follow the dark money. Try. That's that's the kind of stuff you can do. As nerds, you know how to process information. Find it, track it, expose it. Follow the power lines. Who is influencing what? And be creative. It's improvisation, it is repair, it is making do. Learn to live with less, because that's always good, right? Consume less resources, emit less CO2, be used to being poor. We're not really poor. Most of us are not. Not in the, I'm living in the dirt, I have nothing to eat poor. Again, plenty of people are, but we're not. Get into the mindset of not having things. What does that mean? Do you need to own something new? Can you just, you know, 90% of my furniture is recycled. Just because that's fun, it's cheaper. So why, why waste money? But many people don't think that because we need every three years you need your furniture in your house, don't you? I mean, I know people who just do that. Every three years, everything goes to the trash, buy new stuff. Okay, fine. Value creation. What makes value? Can you make value without having a proprietary? Big question, right? We, open source has shown the world, the world that that's possible. Can you do that with things that are capital intensive? Eh, that's more difficult. If you need to own machines, if you need to own mines, or if you need to have, you know, how does that work? I don't know, let's find out. Can you make low tech that's useful? Right? These are all challenges for us. Can you be creative with something that's easy to make but very powerful? Communicate and educate. Here we are. Talk to people. Talk to friends and family who are maybe on the confused side. Show them. Especially communication. A lot of the environmental movement has fucked up because they talk about polar bears and pandas. Fuck pandas. Talk people about the grandchildren. No, don't actually fuck pandas, that they're protected animals. But the, the, the message has been traditionally, oh my god, do it for the environment. No, that's wrong. Do it for you. Because that, that gets people going, because that's what people care about. Abstract pandas are for the very few select people who can afford to think about pandas. Most people cannot afford not to think about the grandkids, right? Organize. It really doesn't matter what you do as long as you're getting organized. Go into politics if you have the stomach for it. Be there, show up, step up. Because you have clue and you can at least do the less bad thing. Because there is no best thing. Remember, wicked problems, it's going to be shit anyway. How can we make it less shit? You want to be able to do usual emergency response skills, awareness, first aid, all these basic things that make you a better human. They will help. And leadership. I want to, I don't, can you turn me on? Because that's not audible. This is worth watching. It's short, but I think it's a really good message here. Even though Ted, meh. So ladies and gentlemen, at TED we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> And here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so. Notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So, <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type 
like the shirtless dancing guy that is standing alone. Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> Make sense? Chaotic systems, once it moves, it moves, but following, very important. You don't have to be the guy standing up there or the girl standing up there, it's fine. Support the thing you believe in, right? That's, we don't do enough of that because oh, somebody else will do it. And that's human, it's normal, but scary. Message of this whole talk is not that, oh God, we're gonna be screwed, because we will, we will. That's fine. It is too late to be pessimistic. There simply is no space for that. You can go, ah, it's gonna be terrible. Yeah, whatever, it's gonna be terrible, but now what? So act. That is really my message today, is, is do. It almost doesn't matter what you do, but act. Go out, have fun, have chunk, enjoy, party, observe, plan, think, teach, build, right? But keep in mind, what's the big picture? How does it fit in? And it doesn't always have to fit in, but you know, vote. Not that I need to tell you people, but make sure people go vote to the right things. If you want to continue the conversation, please meet us with the Emergent Earth Village. Um, screenshot of the uh, program, it's all the way to the right. So you have to scroll sideways because it's a huge program. Um, there's the flag, you'll see it flying. Please do come. There will be talks, you can still submit a thing. I know Evertiela will be presenting something soon. There are other people who have brought in last minute thing. Come and talk. And thank you. Thank you for being here in the evening and staying away from the party to listen to a depressing talk. Much appreciated. <laughs> And I'm happy to hang around a bit longer if you want to discuss, because there's, there's no program behind us, I think. Can I give you one question to start, which is um, carbon capture technologies. Do you think they give us any hope? Yeah. Okay, so I'll repeat the question. The, the question was, will carbon capture and storage so, yeah. be the thing to help us? Um, it's complicated. And let me clarify, it's complicated because currently most carbon capture storage technologies emit more CO2 than they save because of the energy intensity, because you're taking extremely diluted gas. You concentrate, it's just thermodynamically terrible. If you can get this done with sufficient renewables, it's still a question. Now, if you can capture it at the source, at let's say at refinery, I think it's a stopgap. Because you might give you a little bit, it slows down, it's not gonna stop it, but it'll slow down until we can develop other things. However, it's an excuse for keep on doing what we're doing and just kind of slap a, a, slap a um, plaster on it and continue. So I'm on very, I'm not decided. We do a lot of work on that though, but so it's, it's been studied heavily, but it's, it's hard, please. If you can tell us what is your recommendation for the hacker spaces to do? Keep on, keep on, keep on existing. No, no, can I, you I, say more? I can say a lot, but not something that's, no, but keep on existing. And what I mean by that is when the shit hits the fan in whatever f uh, shape it is, I want to be a member of a hackerspace. Because that's where the knowledge is, that's where the connections are, that's where community is, that's where skills are. That's where information flows real quick. And that's when how we quicker know what's going on because we are a bunch of smart nerds. What to do exactly? I don't, there's so many ways to do that but don't let them die. We've seen, I'm sure you've all seen that uh, post-COVID, numbers are down in hackerspaces, struggling to get the camps going. Keep that going, because we need that momentum. We need smart people together, not isolated. Hi, I have a question. Please. Um, 
Uh, are there any specific technologies that you would recommend us to research? Oh my God. Um, excellent question, by the way. Um, I do not believe that the sustainability transition at this point is a technical problem. I'm convinced that it's not easy, but I think we have the tech. We know how to build solar, we know how to build waves, we know how to build wind farms. Highly controversial, you could even do safe nuclear, vitorium, whatever you could. It is the organizational capacity, it's the political will, it's the getting your head out of your ass and actually acting. So I believe it's first and foremost a social problem. If anything, go vote, go, go become a president. No, I mean, lead the political movement, stand up, have people vote for you and do the not bad things. But tech specifically, I don't think that's the problem. It's there, a lot is there. And we tend to over obsess about technology because we are technologists, but that's not the problem. And you have to be very careful. Silicon Valley keeps on making the mistake. Oh, we'll just fix it with more technology. No, it's a social problem, not a technical problem. And yes, it has a technical component. Uh, yes, about social problems. Uh, what are we going to do with the baby boom generation? The, uh, they're, they are with so many. They started out voting for welfare systems when they were young, and now they're starting to vote conservative, extremely conservative, uh, con etc. Talk to them about grandkids. Because they're, you know, they're our parents, they're not bad people per se. I mean, there's lots of assholes, but there are lots of very good people who just don't know better. Talk to them about the grandkids. What kind of world do you want for your grandkid? Because that's one thing they'll care about. Because that's what the thing that lives past beyond them. But yeah, that's, we just have to, you know. There is a saying in science progresses one funeral at a time. Because that's how old ideas die, is when prominent old farts just clear the stage including myself at some point, and all of us, but that's what it is. Um, at these hacker camps, I'm always a bit conflicted about like the blinking lights, because yes. they look awesome. They also consume energy, I suppose. No, um, that decimal point somewhere, they're yeah, irrelevant. Yeah, okay. But I, must, uh, I really see it also as a teaching uh, possibility for people like how can you make, uh, like what do you yeah. consume, what not, how batteries, whatever. The, where do you think, like, uh, what's your view on this? And um, where is, like, the, the line where it becomes wasteful? Or That's a very loaded and very good question. Uh, the, um, it is, uh, okay, so when you do the math, the lights are really irrelevant. But people always, like, save the, la uh, save the planet, turn off the lights. Nobody fucking cares. Eat two kilos of meat and you're done. Right? So, so two kilos of meat less, I'm sorry. So the total energy value compared to what you normally would consume in, you know, anybody flown in from the US to be in a conference, they've consumed a CO2 budget for all the lights on this terrain instantly, but at one trip. So that's peanuts. Um, I drive a 10-year-old diesel car. I am standing here talking about sustainability. Like, what the fuck? Why? Because I'm a poor fucking academic and I can't afford the better one. What I can afford is to talk you about, talk, tell you about these things and talk to large petrochemical companies about making their stuff more sustainable. And when a single, okay, Dow Chemicals, in Terneus in Holland, the biggest plastic manufacturer in Europe, they have a single machine that takes 900 megawatts of thermal power continuously. That's several cities worth of power in a single machine. When that thing goes sustainable through hopefully my work, I can fly my rest of, okay, I'm, you know what I mean? So it's very hard to, because, you know, eat less meat, not have kids, that, well, have kids, but make, teach them to be smart and responsible. Um, don't fly. Th those things matter. Blinking lights, LEDs, nah. So yes, have fun, because otherwise you'll be fucking depressed and not actually do anything. No, but that's important, because if you're not here to enjoy life and care about life and want to make sure it keeps on going, then you know, celebrate life while staring death in the eyes. It's like, fuck you, yeah? Uh, 
Actually, that pretty much brings us to time, unless anyone has, has any very, very last questions. No? So I guess thank you very much. Thank Eagle. you all very much. Thank you for coming.